Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church of Claremont, Florida, our traditional service. As we welcome you this morning, whether you're here locally or you're around the country or the world, we welcome you. And we have to say, first of all, there is uh, internet issues that are happening in our whole region. So we're recording the entire service today. And if for some reason you get disconnected, the service will be available to watch later. But right now, as we gather, let us worship our God. Please, if you're able, as we sing our opening hymn, let's stand together. church family it's miss natalie here and we are going to unpack god's truth together today all right kids i want to talk to you this morning about the church you see many people might say that the church is a building that we go to but the church is so much more than that you see back when the church first started they didn't even have a building to go to the church is made up of all of the people that love and follow jesus and I brought with me today a glass of water, and each drop of water in this glass represents somebody who's a part of the church. Our pastors, our small group leaders, our families, you and me, anybody that loves and follows Jesus is a part of the church. Now, if I was to dump this glass of water out, what do you think would happen? We would probably have a mess, right? And the drops of water would all separate everywhere. Well, I brought some other stuff with me today because God wants the church to be one, to be united. And so we're going to talk about that. And I have this jar, and inside this jar is some powder, and that powder represents love. So I'm going to put a scoop of love in this other cup right here. And then I'm going to add the church into that cup of love. And here's why. You see, in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 14, God tells us this. The 
most important piece of clothing that you will put on is love. Love is what binds us together in perfect harmony. Isn't that cool? You see, what if we had a bunch of people in the church and they didn't really like each other and they were mean and they didn't agree and they argued and they fought all the time? Do you think people would really feel loved? Hmm, probably not. Do you think people would want to get to know Jesus? I don't think so. But God says, if when we love him and we love each other, we are woven together, we are united as one, and the church becomes one. And then as we love God and we love other people, that shows out into the world around us, and more and more people are drawn to Jesus. You see, love is what holds us together so that we're not making messes and hurting feelings, but we are all one church. Even if we live all over the country, it is love that makes the church one. And so let's look at our cup that we had. We poured all of God's people into the cup of love. Is it going to scatter? <gasps> look at that. Love binds us together. All right, friends, I want to encourage you this week as you go about your day to show love to someone. As you do, you will be the church to the world around you. All right, friends, until next time, remember that God loves you very much, and so do I. Bye-bye. Thank you, Miss Natalie. Good morning, everyone. We are so, so glad to see you and, and knowing that you're what with us right now, and, and we know that many of you are anticipating the day that we are going to reassemble which is two weeks from today, September 13th. So we just want to let you know that we will be gathering in person for those that are able and willing and feel safe doing so. We will only be doing 11 a.m. as usual at, during this time right now. We will be wearing masks. However, if you do not feel comfortable, please, we want to encourage you to stay home because we're going to still be online and we're going to include you as we do. You are part of the church wherever you are, and we love you all so much. But we do want you to know that we are here for you. I'm going to give you an email address. It's wecare at fumc-claremont.org. Here's a couple things we, we want you to know. If you are planning on coming back on the 13th, will you send us an email to the We Care address? Just let us know you're planning on coming. It's just to give us an approximate number so that we can be absolutely ready for you, which we will be. Also, if you need prayers or if you have questions, maybe you're feeling like you just need some support. We do have support groups online that will continue online as well as Celebrate Recovery, which will also meet in person on September 17th, that Thursday night. But we can also call you on the phone. We can pray with you anytime. And if you want to come out in person, the pastors will be available on Sundays at 8.30 in the morning and at 12.30. So today you can come on out outside the Wesley Center, stay in your car. We're going to have a mask on. You can have a mask on and we'll pray with you in person. But however we can help to connect you to Christ, the church is still here. But God, who is bigger than it all, hasn't left us either for even a moment. And that's why we're gathering. That's why we're here, to, to pray to him, to worship him, to give him the glory and praise. So let us just take a few moments. Let's bow our heads and prepare to pray to God.
Let us pray. Almighty, most loving and amazing God, we bow before you humbly and passionately because we know you are with us. And Lord, we know that that storms come our way and, and we find ourselves sometimes caught up in all the things going on around us. But Lord, you are bigger than it all. So Lord, we come to you. We come to you to allow us to connect to your Holy Spirit, that we would feel your presence, that we would know and feel your mighty power at work. Lord, we pray for those even in our country that are affected by storms that are physically brought to them by the hurricanes. Lord, we know you are with them. Lord, we pray for those that are hurting right now, physically, emotionally. We know you are with them. Lord, you're with us right now to bring to us the reminders, Lord, that, that every single morning you provide us new mercies. You are the giver of new life made available every day. So, Lord, may we turn to you. May we release our old ways. May we release to you any ways in which we've been going in the wrong direction and bring us back towards you, the new and right direction. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And now as you taught us, we come to you wherever we are. We pray out loud, praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. As we gather this morning, I just want to take a moment, and I say each week, thank you for your continual faithful giving as you, as you send your tithes, your offerings to just the work of what God is doing and how the church has kept going. We haven't missed a beat. And how through all this live streaming, everything that's been happening, I guess I just want to take a moment and just first of all say thank you for those who, you, it's what you send in, and uh, you mail in or you drop it by the office. Some of you uh, do it online. Others do the PayPals or the text messaging. However you give, thank you. But also, I want to say, above our tithes and offerings, this week in particular, I want to challenge you. What we have is called UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief. And they have been in southwest Louisiana and that whole region, as well as northwest Texas. UMCOR has been there, and they are at work helping those in need and loss and struggling if you'd like to give to that Hurricane Laura, that whole area and all the mess that happened, Hurricane Relief, and make your check out to the church or whatever, however you give, but call it Hurricane Relief and it'll go to UMCOR. So thank you, church, as we are here, as we give, as we pray, and once again, as we sing together. I have to say thank you. To our tech team and our traditional choir and the folks as we continue to offer you special things. Now, this in the name of our Lord.
These have been challenging times, but the body of Christ has proven itself resilient. We've gathered in different ways, in different places, yet stood steadfast as the church. We have found peace in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. In our struggle, we have lived out our faith. In the midst of the unknown, we have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. Throughout history, the church has thrived in adversity, and this moment is no different. The power of God is unstoppable, His love unending, His grace unrelenting, His glory undeniable. Today, no matter where we gather, we remain God's people. Our mission has not changed. Our calling has not been altered, and nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. We are the church, and today we stand resilient. Welcome again, everyone, to First United Methodist Church of Claremont, Florida. This is our traditional service. And if you're having issues with your internet, we are too. And I just want to say, if for whatever reason, for the next few minutes we get disconnected, we are recording the entire service and it will be available. So, as we welcome you this morning, I have to say greetings to all of you right here throughout South Lake County who also are having internet issues, as well as throughout the state and the country and the world so it's, I just want to say greetings, uh, and especially I want to send greetings to those who may be watching from Louisiana. For those uh, in the southwest Louisiana, that whole region that just was decimated, decimated by, by Hurricane Laura, so please know our prayers are with you, and also now our giving will come. And as we do, I just want to say uh, our prayers will continue as well. Also, I got to send greetings to everyone, and especially this morning, I want to do a shout out to a guy named Gene. I met Gene this week, and Gene is going to be moving to our area. He and his wife are going to be, and family are looking for a church. So Gene, you're here checking us out. This is who we are. As we come, we're just a traditional, orthodox, Christ-centered, United Methodist Church. So welcome, and I'm glad you all are here. I got to say a quick shout out to my mom who turned 94 the week before last. And as we do, my brothers happened to be there, both of them, and they had a little parade through the medical care facility. In fact, I got to say, first of all, my older brother showed up with his Jeep. And as he came, uh, there's his Jeep, and he's there with his mask on. <laughs> and so then my younger brother was there. Uh, they had a truck, and if you look in the back of the truck, there is a blow-up uh, uh, birthday cake. And so that was there. But of course, the star of the show was Mom. She was out there, and she was waving happy birthday. So I love you guys. I miss you. One day we'll get together. But <laughs> anyhow, as we come, I got to just say, we're in this series. And, and as we continue to worship in the series, I love that bumper video. It was resilient. That's an incredible word. In fact, I was looking it up, the definition. It can be a noun or it can be an adjective. And as it, look at it, the ability, here it is, the definition of resilient. It's the ability to become strong or healthy, even successful, after having gone through something difficult or something bad. Does that make sense? Or how about this one? It is as an adjective. It's the ability of something to return to its original shape or its original design, the intended design, after it's been pulled, stretched, pressed, or bent, or many other things. Resilient. I love that. Doesn't that describe us? And especially with all of this uncertainty, and I've been using the analogy of a, of a desert landscape for what we have right now in our culture and how we long for 
something to renew us, looking for that stream of water in a desert. Not just water, but as Jesus said, the life-giving water, the resilient faith that can only come from living water, Jesus himself. I've been doing a lot of reading and studying on our culture, in particular, of all the things that we're going through. And Mark Sayers is an author and pastor in Australia. He does an incredible amount of work on this. And I, I just, you know, oftentimes he talks about our culture and the weird place and time that we're in. In fact, it's, it's like we're in this season where people are looking for answers. And we have the internet when it's working. And, and we have all these things where we scramble to look for answers, but there's this shifting away from God where people are looking for answers to align with what they feel, what they want, our wishes, what I want, what I desire. We all want freedom, but there's a sense of, I got to have my freedom to do what I want to do. I don't want any rules. I don't want any authority to define me and who I am. No one needs to tell me what to do, what to say, what to think, how to live. And again, the term that I've been using, it's like this rise of what's called Gnosticism in the second century when people felt they were more important than God. And as we look at that, it sounds crazy, but what's really interesting is that people will realize and are realizing there are no answers to life apart from God. In fact, there is a shift. The Barna study uh, did a study. Almost 20%, one out of five people right now, are starting to ask questions about God. It's a turning back to God. Questions about life and meaning and purpose. Who is God? Where is God? And I have to say, if you're watching and you're struggling and you feel a bit awkward or maybe even embarrassed, please don't. And you're wondering about God and you have all these questions. If you want to call or contact us, please do so. We will help you any way that we can. Because quite honestly, God is our answer. Only God. It's not in a person. It's not in our intelligence. It's not in institutions. And it's certainly not in the government. Only God is our answer. And only God knows who we are and what we need. All right, with all that being said, as we continue our series, I want to look at the context today. And in fact, I had you read from the Gospel of Luke. But this this situation that I'm going to be going through, and we're going to break it down through, through the verses, but this situation really comes to us from Matthew, Mark, as well as Luke. So it's recorded in all three, and the situation takes place early on in Jesus' ministry, as he was starting his ministry and how he uh, was healing people, forgiving their sins, healing people, doing all kinds of miracles and teaching. But at the same time, he was calling his disciples. He had called Peter and James and John. And as he called his disciples together, he now had these crowds following him. And it was not, he was still calling disciples. So People were watching. Miracles were happening and all this stuff was going on. But now let's pick it up in chapter 5, the Gospel of Luke, beginning with verse 27. As as Jesus was continuing on his journey, after this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi. He was sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And I want to just pause for a minute there as we break this thing down. So, seems pretty harmless calling a tax collector. Do you know any tax collectors? We really don't have 
tax collectors because our government's the one that collects our taxes. But when you think about it, those days, tax collectors were hated by everybody. I had a friend years ago when I was uh, in college and I had my own little painting, house painting business. And I worked with a guy named Claude. And Claude was a retired school teacher. And Claude said, you know, I'm going to run for the tax appraiser. I want to be the tax appraiser or the tax assessor or whatever they call it. And so he was elected. It's the easiest job in the world. They'll just send you money and they'll pay you. All you got to do is take people's data and put it into a formula. This is before computers and stuff. Put it in the formula and you mail them out. Here's where your taxes are going to be. Well, that meant he was telling people their taxes were going up. He was about a week, two weeks into it. His name was Claude, I, and I love Claude. He was a great guy. A couple weeks into it, he goes, I hate this job. I can't stand it. Everybody's calling me and yelling and cussing at me because I'm raising their taxes. I'm not raising their taxes. It's the formula. But they're not listening. They don't like it. Take that times 10 when we look at Matthew. Levi, rather. And Levi and Matthew are the same person, just a different name. So as we look at Levi... He's sitting there, and he's a tax collector. He's hated by everybody, Jews or any ethnicity, any country, any person traveling by his tax booth. They didn't like him. They hated him. Why? Because he would lie, he would cheat, he would steal, he would do all kinds of things. Let me give you an example. I'm sitting here at the booth, and you're walking by, and you're coming into a town, out of a town, leaving the country, wherever you're going, and I see you. I'm working for Rome. Levi worked for Rome. It was Roman occupation. And as he worked for Rome, he then said, basically, they wanted, uh, and I'll give you an example. They want $25 for every person. That's all. That's what they want. Now, he had the freedom to get anything above that that he wanted just so Rome got their $25. So in other words, you come walking by, and I'm Levi, and I look at you, and I say, I need 50 bucks, and you got to pay me. And I could set any amount I wanted, and people knew that. Rome got their 25, I pocketed the other 25. You see, that's the way he operated. 75, I want 75 bucks. You look like you got a lot, pay me. Rome gets the 25, I get the 50, and that's how he would operate. He would lie, he would cheat, he would harass, he would steal, he'd deceive, he did all that stuff. You can see why people hated him. Now, enter Jesus, he shows up, and he sees him sitting there. He knows everything about him. And you say, well, oh, maybe Matthew was one of those, or Levi was one of those guys that just kind of, you know, he was a nicer. No, he was a liar, he was a cheater, he was a stealer. A deceiver. He was all of that. And Jesus looked into his eyes and he said, follow me. Join me. Accompany me. Be my disciple. Follow me. Learn from me. This right here is the essence of Christianity. Right here, This is it. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, calling, follow me. To Levi, to you, to me, to everybody in the world. Surrender your life to me. Let me lead you. Let me guide you. Let me use you. Follow me. Accompany me. Join me. Why? Because I love you. And I'm here to save you. You know, often we hear people say, well, all religions, you know, all the religions are pretty much the same and all are good people and blah, 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 and all this stuff. They aren't all the same. The answer is no, they're not the same. You see, it's only Christianity where God comes to us through Christ, inviting us into a personal living relationship 
today. He did then and he does today. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The Father, eternity, heaven, through me. I am the only way. Follow me, he said. Join me, accompany me. And I love what Levi did as we continue in verse 28. And Levi, as soon as Jesus said, follow me, Levi got up. He left everything and he followed him. What, 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 what do I mean by that? What does that mean? Got up, oh yeah, okay, I'll just do that. No, no, no. He left his money. He left his future. He left everything. But he also left his lying, he left his cheating, he left his stealing, he left all this whole world that he had to follow Jesus. I want you to think about this. If ever in your heart you ever felt like, what the heck would God want anything to do with me? There's no way. (laughs) And I hear this all the time. You have no way, you have no idea what I've done. I don't have any idea. I don't want to know what you've done. But God knows everything about you. And he sent Jesus Christ to save you. And he's here to say, follow me. Today. So first of all, when you think of this scenario, Jesus calling Matthew, or Levi, and he's saying, follow me. And Levi's response was, get up, follow him. Here's the deal. If ever you felt disqualified, you're wrong. You ever felt like God wouldn't use you, couldn't use you, you're wrong. You're not disqualified. Number two, be willing to follow. Be willing to say, I have left this for this. I used to live here. I used to do this. Now I'm living with my God doing this. Be willing. To give up your old for the new. Now, number three, this isn't for a season. This isn't so when things are going good. This isn't, well, I'll just, you know, follow him now. This is saying, I am going to follow you the rest of my life. I used to live this way. Now I'm going to live this way. You're not disqualified. Be willing to give up. And number three, shift how you live. Hear the call of Jesus. Follow me. All right. So what's the response? What does Levi do? And I I love this. This is one of my favorites. Here we go. Verse 29. He says, and Levi, he's following Jesus. He, he, He like had this great banquet. He had this house party for Jesus at his house. And there's a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were eating with them. You just didn't eat with people that were sinners because that meant you were sharing your life. The intimacy of a meal meant that you were as close to them as you were anyone. Unless you were Jesus. In fact, he's throwing this party And all of his lying, cheating, stealing, conniving friends are right there in the house. It was a house full. All piled in there. And Jesus crossed a lot of lines when he had that meal. In fact, I love how the Pharisees in the next verse, they look, they just is like with the disciples. The Pharisees. The teachers of the law who belong to that, their sect, these are the religious leaders, the scholars, the knowledgeable people, or the religious people. They complain to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? For heaven's sakes, and I'll add this in, are you nuts? These are the worst people. And if you call yourself good, you're going to be with them? And I love how they fussed at the disciples But Jesus heard every word, (laughs) and he responded. And I love this. Verse 31. Jesus says, and I'm going to add this in. Hey, he answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor. 
sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, you, but those who know they're sinners and need to repent. The house full of tax collectors and sinners. I love that. We all are sinners in need of our God. All of us have sinned and fall short of his glory. There are no exceptions. Jesus is here to save us all. All right, so we continue on. And I love how it flows together, the next part. You know, they said to him, and, and this is as they were traveling, they said, you know, John's disciples, they often would fast and pray. This is John the Baptist. And, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. They, they're fasters and prayers on a regular basis, all this stuff, you know. But yours, your yours, your disciples, they go on eating and drinking. In fact, Jesus answered them. <laughs> I love how he's answering. Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, then they will fast. See, Jesus was the bridegroom. He was there with them. In fact, I love how he said this because his response is, I'm here. I'm right here in front of you. And one day, I'm going to be gone. Basically, fasting brings us into the presence of God on a deeper level, brings us closer to God. He was right there, the presence of God sitting right there among them. You see, fasting isn't a ritual, as the Pharisees had turned it into a ritual or a practice that they were doing. Fasting is about a relationship, the relationship with God and the closeness with God. And he was sitting right there with them. All right, fasting. Let me ask you, last week, uh, Pastor Darren shared on fasting. Did you, w did you pay attention to that? Did you watch it? And if you didn't, then I would like you to watch it. But here's the deal. We talked about fasting. In fact, did you start? Did you, do you fast? She challenged you 21 days. Today makes it 14 days of this challenge and this prayer. Not as some little ritual that you put in but for your relationship with your God. An exercise that calls us into a deeper relationship with God. Have you done it? Are you doing it? If not, start. Maybe food. Maybe it's not food. Maybe you're, you would skip a meal now and then and spend time for you, when you feel the hunger you pray to God. Or maybe it's other things. Maybe it's fasting TV or maybe the news. And I have to ask this. It's kind of crazy. I did it the other service. But I want to ask who, in, uh, just for a show of hands, <laughs> I can't see any hands, but I think I can feel them on this one. How many of you, when you watch the news, and you watch television, you get all angry and upset and you just, your blood pressure goes up and you get mad. Anybody? Yes. I can feel the hands going up. What if you fasted the news, turn it off, and went into a time to seek your God and a closeness with your God? What if you fasted from posting negative things on social media? What if you refrained from that and when you felt that, suddenly you decided, I am not going to do that, but I'm going to go to my God and the intimacy with Christ and I'm going to make that a personal sacrifice and go before my God. You see, the focus for fasting is totally on our relationship with Jesus. Letting him be that living water that we long for in this desert. Fasting, sacrificing, which brings us to that prayer and the call to prayer in your heart.
God, help me focus just on you and not the stuff. My heart, my life, praying for your church, praying for the community, praying for our country. Basically, Jesus was telling him, as he's telling us, my presence is more important than anything else. Then your religious practices that you've set up, then your fasting has become legalistic and ritualistic in how you do that. I'm not bringing you a new religion. I'm not bringing that. I'm bringing you into a relationship with your Father in heaven. I love that. Let's continue on. And this is in there. And, it's, and again, it's just so, so practical of how he just answers. So when he finishes with that, you know, I, you know, and he goes into the next section. He goes, then Jesus, he gave him this illustration. Here's the deal. No one tears a piece of cloth from a garment and then uses it to patch an old garment. Then the new garment would be ruined and the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. Now, it sounds kind of crazy. But he's basically saying, patches don't work. You can't take something that's old and patch it with something that's new. I want you to think about our lives. You think about Levi. Levi sitting there doing what he was doing, tax collector stuff. Jesus said, follow me. He got up. He got up and he followed him. Done. Here's what I'm going to do. I used to live this way, and now I'm going to live this way. You see, Levi was a sinner in need of God. He heard Jesus say, follow me, and he left everything. In our culture, we are sinners in need of our God, but we have a lot. We have much. We have so much. We can be tempted. When we hear, follow me, we can be tempted by, I'm going to call it a gravitational pull back to the self. But what about me? What about what I want? What about all the things that I'm worrying about? What about things that I'm afraid of? What about all this stuff that's going on? What about me? And then we try to add Jesus into our lives. We try to take Jesus and say, yeah, but okay, well, I'll take Jesus and maybe I'll just try to put a patch on, on when I'm afraid, worry, Jesus, help me there. Or maybe I'll take Jesus and I'll try to put a patch on, help me w- agree with my views or how my opinions and my attitude, and I'm just patch, patch, patch. And he's saying, follow me, and we're wanting to put on a patch. You see, it's too easy to to think that we can add Jesus as a patch to our lives, it doesn't work that way. He is not a patch. It's either our life or it's a life with Jesus. We're all tempted. We're tempted to patch. And it doesn't work. Okay, I come from a long line of patchers. I'm sorry, Mom, but I know we didn't have a lot of money. We just patched everything we had. <laughs> we patched cars. We patched clothing. We patched bicycles. We patched and fixed, and then everything was patched. But <laughs> and the reason I'm saying that is because I was thinking of one time in particular. And um, again, another time I had my little painting business. It was years ago. But um, I had a Ford Econoline van, and it was a 1972 Ford Econoline van. So... Many of you in this service generation, you understand what I'm talking about. Others have no clue. Actually, it'd be vintage if I had it today. But anyway, I got a, a new, newer. It was still old and beat up, but it was newer than the first one. So I had this Econoline van with a V8. I upgraded from the 6. And I think it was the Ford, I think it was the 302, if I remember right. Anyway, and so I got this going. And it was, you know, hauled all my junk around, and it was fun. It was my little truck. I love it, the van. Until one day, I had a leak in the power steering. And so I got under there, and I started fiddling with it. I thought, well, what the heck? The power steering hose leaks. I could fix it. So I took a bicycle inner tube, and I cut a chunk out of it, 
and I, I was going to put it on, on the uh, power steering hose, but then I thought, well, let me double it over just in case, make it a little more secure. And I had a couple of screw clamps that I put on there. So I'm tightening down the screw clamps. I got the inner tube on there. And I thought, there you go. We're good to go. And I got my brother out there, my younger brother, jumped in. I said, start it up. And he started up the van, and it's sitting there running. And I said, look at that. It's brilliant. I fixed it. I was probably 17 at the time, maybe 18, probably 17. Anyway, so it looked perfect. I said, gosh, this is so cool. I said, now turn the wheel because that's when it adds pressure to the power steering. And so when he turned the wheel, I kid you not, I'm laying there on the ground looking at this thing, and the inner tube just started forming this big, giant bubble. And as it formed, I said, stop, 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 shut it off, shut it off. And before I could do anything, it went boom, and it blew power steering fluid all over the place. It was at that moment I learned about high-pressure hoses. You cannot, <laughs> you cannot patch a high-pressure hose. You need to get a new one. You see, when you and I think we're going to patch our lives together and we're going to hold on and we got this Jesus just sort of patching everything, but we haven't really changed, nothing's new, and we're sitting here trying to patch all this thing together, and then all of a sudden, it's fine until pressure comes. You throw in a COVID virus, you throw in something, and the pressure is going to blow the patch. In fact, think of where you are right now. Think of your life. Are you like, feel like your patches are coming loose? Because you're not fooling anybody. You're only fooling yourself. It's not about being good and religious and trying to patch Jesus or a little thought here and that. Jesus isn't a patch. He's a way of life. He said, if you're not for me, you're against me. You see, what happens is we can fake it until pressure comes, and that's what will tell the story. I love how the last example after the patch, he then said in verse 37, he said these words. He goes, you know, no one who puts new wine into old wineskins. See, the wine, the wine is, is fermenting and it's still processing. Nobody puts new wine into an old dried wineskin. For the new wine that's still processing, fermenting, it would burst the skins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be stored in new wineskins. I love that. You see, when we try to patch, it's not going to work. When we look at our lives, oh, we want Jesus, we want the newness, but we've got to be willing to get rid of the old. You can't have both. In fact, verse 39 as he's looking at the Pharisees, telling them all this stuff. And then he says these words, and I love it. But no one, basically you guys, who drinks the old wine, you're so wrapped up in what you're doing, seems to want the new wine. The old wine is just fine, they say. In other words, you are so comfortable with your life and where you are, you have no room for Jesus. I love his honesty and I love his words. Think, again, I want you to think of your life as a faith journey, not just this whole COVID thing, but your entire life and where you are. Are you comfortable with where you are? And I'm going to go back through this. As with the Pharisees, does Jesus, yeah, no, yeah, I, I like what I have. You're not fooling anybody, only yourself. In fact, do you even want new? Or maybe you've wanted new and you said yes when he says follow me, but you kind of revert back to your old ways. Let, let me ask you, when Jesus says follow me, what does that mean to you? Are you a follower 
Have you said yes? Have you made that commitment as with Levi? Have you stepped and said, yes, I'll follow? Are you willing to say, you know, I used to live this way. I want to live with you, Lord, now that you would change and transform me. And not for a season, but for the rest of your life. Do you think as you walk with God, do your, is your desire, rather, is your desire to know him on a deeper level? Is your desire to walk in his presence through the fasting and practices that say, God, I want to do these exercises that, that shut the world out and bring you in closer and deeper so that I can live in this world? Is this how you're living? Or do you add a patch every time you panic? Oh, I better put a patch on here or a patch on here. And say, oh, Jesus, help this, patch this, patch this. Time out. It's either the old or it's going to be the new. When he says, follow me, he means follow me. Maybe you started following and you just kind of reverted back to putting patches on. Where are you this morning? For all of us to hear his call into that deeper intimate relationship with him and truly, not patching, but seeking the new. For the old is gone and the new has come. In Jesus our Lord, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the morning. And for all of us this morning, may we Hear that call of follow me. Follow me today. Follow me for the rest of your life here on earth and into eternity. May we hear your call this morning, Lord. And maybe for somebody you've never invited Jesus into your life. Maybe you've gone to church or maybe you have just sort of felt that I'm just, God would never want me. I've never been a, that good of a person. Doesn't matter. We're all in need of a Savior. Maybe this is your day when you say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I want to live for you. I want to know your forgiveness. And I want to know you personally. Let that be your prayer. But for all of us, as we seek you and desire that deeper relationship, may we realize that it is pursuing the new and not the old. Forgive us when we try to patch things together. Lord, we know it doesn't work. Be that new wine and a new wineskin for each of us and in our hearts and our lives. Give us the strength. Give us the courage and the guts just to follow you, Jesus especially this day, and we will be your witnesses now and forever. In the name, your name, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. At this time, I'd like, if you could, if you would stand as we sing our closing hymn today. Georgiana, please.
Thank you, Eddie, for as we share that song. I love that song. As we continue to live stream next week, and then we will continue, as Pastor Dawn shared, we will continue for, for the, just from now on. We will be live streaming. However, physical regathering is in a couple of weeks. Do call the office. Let us know. You're going to come. We'd love to have just sort of an idea of a head count. But as we thank God for the day, our prayer is for you in the depth of your relationship with Jesus, that it would be real and that it would be new every day. Let's bow our heads. May God go with each of us and all of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, guard our hearts, our lives, and our souls. In your holy and gracious name we pray. And everybody said, amen. On behalf of Pastor Don and myself, we'd like to say thank you for watching. God bless you.